All right, we're back in beautiful Southern California at the 13th Meeting of the Minds uh, Advancement Services and Annual Giving Conference. This is Bob Brudensky sitting on the patio again with my pal Brian Gore. Hi, Brian. Hey, Bob. How are you doing? All, uh, it's all good. Um, joining us at the moment is Nathan Fay, who's here from uh, City of Hope in Southern California. He has just literally finished a session here called Showcasing Your Value, Prospect Development as a Revenue Generator in the Age of Big Data and I can deconstruct that title into a couple of interesting parts. He's also the recent author of a book called Precision Prospect Development, How to Get a Seat at the Table and Be an Influencer, uh, all things that we want to know more about. Um, Nathan, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, one of Brian's favorite starter questions is tell us how you sort of got into this profession and for anybody who doesn't know City of Hope, tell okay. a little bit about that. Okay, I'll start off by talking about City of Hope. So City of Hope is a local cancer hospital in the greater LA area. We're located in Duarte, California, that's the city, um, just east of LA. And it's, City of Hope has been around for over a hundred years. Um, we started off as actually a TB sanatorium. Um, where you know, we basically took the sickest of the sickest folks at that time, there was no cure. Um, so some philanthropists actually um, gathered together some money, be money because they were sick of seeing um, you know, people collapsing and dying in the streets of Los Angeles. And they bought a parcel of land, which is now what City of Hope sits on. And they said, you know, we're gonna start treating these people and we're gonna you know, um, bring, bring doctors out here and we're gonna, you know, the environment in the desert is, is conducive to you know, treating TB because it's dry. Um, and then after you know they, they cured that and took care of that and that's no longer a problem, um, cancer became the next focus. Yeah. Cancer and diabetes. So we are a cancer and diabetes NCI designated hospital. When would that evolution have happened? Just out of curiosity. Ah, uh, probably in the 30s or 40s. Yeah. Yeah, a long time ago. Just mission transfer from one uh, cause to another good cause. Yeah. yeah. And how do you end up in philanthropy? So I ended up in philanthropy sort of a roundabout way. I didn't even really know that philanthropy <laughs> existed at the time, right? I mean, I was actually on track to become a professor and to teach philosophy. Okay. And so I wanted to change the world. I knew that I really wanted to impact the world in the way that all of my great philosophical influences had changed the world. Okay. Um, among them are definitely like Malcolm X and um, Gandhi and Abraham Joshua Heschel, okay. a lot of the pioneers in civil rights movements and okay. folks who made you know, civil changes, um, and Thoreau, of course, civil disobedience. Um, so I was really kind of driven by this idea that you know one person can really have an impact on, on the world. And the way that I thought my impact was going to happen would be through teaching and writing books. You figured out and both. I, I, exactly, exactly. So, um, so I was going into my PhD program. In philosophy, there's a lot of sort of like math involved in philosophy. To be good mm -hmm. at philosophy, you have to really be good at logic and math and research, of course. When you know, I'd just gotten a master's degree. And so getting, while I was getting my master's degree, I paid for that by working as a library assistant. So I got a free scholarship to, to get a master's degree in philosophy um, to basically help professors and help folks come in and do their research projects. And I noticed while doing that that, you know, we, my friends would kind of tease me and give me a nickname called The Finder because I could find anything. Didn't matter what it was, I could find it. We had like 15 databases we used at the library. Somebody would come in with a subject and I just got so much joy out of like solving problems and finding the information. So um, I moved out to California and it was time to get a, get a job, you know, a real, a real job after graduate school. I decided not to go for the PhD at that time um, because it was just, you know, too much, too much studying, too bureaucratic. Um, the folks that I loved in the 60s and 70s, the professors, they sort of got marginalized. They weren't necessarily always thought of as like these great academia folks because they were, you know, out there, um, you know, like Cornell West is, is a more recent example. Sure. Um, and so I was just kind of like, you know, I don't really want to get into these politics and, and so I want to take a break. And I felt at that time I was kind of going through an existential dilemma. So existentialism was one of the subjects, one of my favorite subjects, and what I wrote my, my master's degree thesis on was the interplay between the subjective and the truth and the universal and existence and sort of just these platonic ideals seen through this existential Kierkegaardian lens and how to kind of make sense of existence, right? Who are we? Why are we here? Just that, just those questions. I was like, hey, I'd love to, you know, be a professor and get to be paid to figure this stuff out. Do you know what he's talking about? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, so, so I, mean, I was afraid of that. It's like, it's like, <laughs> this is like a case study. It's sort of perfect because I think a lot of people, maybe they don't talk to their prospect researchers as much as they should. So this is a perfect example. You, your prospect researchers are actually naturally curious people. Yes. The, the, the best ones are. Right? Yes. And um, you might think of them as people who are sort of locked away in, in a closet who, who just, you know, 
maybe find rich people for you. Uh, but, but in fact, they, they may be the most curious people in your advancement office. So I would uh, say a lot of advancement people are curious too. I think frontline fundraisers, yeah. curiosity helps yeah. so much with that kind of work. Yeah, well, Just absolutely. to sincerely be interested in what somebody's talking yeah, about. Yeah, well, and, and, increase, and increasingly as we start to engage donors, it's going to be this world of ideas that, that engages people. And we, we've seen actually in the last year or so a couple of really big gifts to philosophy programs and uh, by people within business, right, yes. that, that people didn't expect, right? Uh, yeah. I, I apologize for interrupting no, no, the philosophical okay. context, I would say the, the, the excellent the, philosophical this is, this context. Is, this is really amazing. Actually, the <laughs> philosophy degree did not serve me that well when I, when I moved out to Silicon Valley. Okay, yeah. However, what I've heard and what I've seen is in the last few years, a philosophy degree is actually highly sought after now in Silicon yeah. Valley and in yeah. the tech world yeah. because we're the ones that were trained on how to think and the logic and then how to like tell the story and how to tell the story of data. Yeah. So that actually falls in. So I was uh, looking to get in the world of finance. It wasn't for me. Um, while I was looking for other jobs, I ended up on this job at Stanford. I thought I wanted to learn more about business and finance. So I took a job which was called accounting assistant. And I was like, hey, I want to learn about that. Well, it turned out to be a gift processing job. Sure. <laughs> and so I started out in gift processing. You so were on your way. I was on my way. So <laughs> nine months later, I moved over to the research team. And, you know, that's... That's, that's it. I mean, I remember on my first day in prospect research, um, just because I just love data so much and love stories, they were teaching me how to do ratings. And they're like, oh, you know, your quote is 15 a month or whatever, you know, that's what we'll do. And this is your first day, it's going to be okay, it's going to be okay, you know. And we did one together. And then my trainer was, he was like, do you think you can find another one? And since I'd done gift processing and records, I quickly just went into the query side, wrote a query, because I saw her one example, took what I learned from that one example, built a query, got like 50 other people. We started rating that end of that day, my first day on the job, I had my monthly quote. Right. And she right. was like, whoa, whoa. <laughs> That's right. You'd be, you be careful that with some of these state jobs. You don't want to get the quota. Exactly, you're, exactly. You're, you're gonna break it's, like that, it's like that movie Big, you know, you don't want <laughs> <laughs> And now we're sitting here with your new book. Exactly. It's quite a, a bit of a fast forward, I, I would yes. say. And uh, we were chuckling. He literally just finished a session as a teacher. Yep. Um, and so his rhythm for all of the talking points is still very, uh, the adrenaline is still I'm running. in the flow. <laughs> um, give us the thesis about precision prospect development. You know, the, the thesis, there's a friend of mine that read this book who I've worked with at Stanford for the last 15 years and kept in touch. He's now in Hawaii now, Christopher Butler. Shout out, Chris. Um, you know, he did a review and he, he read it and he said there's like eight books packed into this one book. Okay. So it's hard to, I mean, I'll, I'll say what I think the thesis <laughs> is, but I really, I really packed just, I mean, there's like 70 chapters. Each chapter's no more than three pages, two to, two, to, two to four pages, kind of on average, so that I just get to the essence of each subject and just kind of move on, move on, right? Holistically, um, it's really a manual for, I feel like right now we're at a crossroads in our field. Um, and I feel like right now there is a vacancy at the table and people are starting to become aware of it because the boards are becoming more savvy. And I feel like it is board driven because the boards are starting to demand What's your data infrastructure look like? Who's running your data? What do they do? Show me your data viz. You know, show me your sophistication in data. And to be honest, our senior leaders don't know how to have those conversations. At least at the last two organizations I've worked in, I know they don't because they had to bring me to the board to have those conversations. And that was the only time I was ever, the board was ever allowed to see me, Nothing right? Nothing personal. Nothing personal. No, really. I mean, I was not allowed in board meetings, board rooms, never anywhere allowed to be near the board. But it was because they, they had no one else to explain right. our data strategy, our data infrastructure, what sure. we were doing, how sophisticated we were with our data. They had to bring me to that, to that seat. But I was only there for a little bit, yeah. <laughs> and, then I, and then I go back to my go back to my day job. Thank you, Nathan. Yeah. You can go back. To yes, the office. Yeah. but I think we're leaving money. I think we're leaving money on the table, you know. And I think it's about revenue and donor experience, you know. And this probably echoes some of the stuff you were just talking about with your last guest. You know, it's about creating that perfect donor experience, and it's about getting as much revenue as we can get. The only way that's going to take place, in my opinion, is if Prospect Development Advancement Services gets a seat at the senior leadership table and is driving strategy. Oftentimes, because we're not there at the table and we're not driving strategy, the balance of our organizations falls off, right? And, a, and a, there's pressure to raise more revenue, there's pressure to get more, more, more money from the senior leadership, and they think, as anybody would think, I guess, we need more boots on the ground. Of course, more fundraisers equals more money. And then what they realize is that, what they don't realize is, they start stack, stacking on fundraiser, 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 but they forget about prospect development, and they don't give us more people to make sure that those fundraisers come in and it can actually raise that money. If you have a proper balance of researcher to fundraiser, you can get more value out of your 
your boots on the ground that you currently have than hiring three more people and not adding another researcher. So this, go ahead. this really is a moment, isn't it? Like you said, that the traditional sort of fundraising growth playbook would be go get more fundraisers. We're heading into a campaign. Let's right. get more feet on the ground. Yeah, boots on the ground, boots on the ground. But the, the identification of those prospects hasn't quite caught up to the pace of how you do that most effectively these days. Yeah, it's the balance. I mean, if you have like a eight to one, seven to one ratio, and then you go out and you hire a bunch more people, your ratio is out of balance so that, you know, you're not giving them the best portfolio, then you're not giving them the best actionable intelligence and the prospects at the right time and in the right place for the right ask so that they can actually get the value out of that, um, out of that portfolio. And your well, reference to board people is very interesting that you've got for-profit people who have no choice <laughs> but to keep up with this kind of best practice. Exactly. Yes. Sitting at a table saying, why are we doing these sort of antiquated things, yes. which is when they run down the hall and get you. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and, then, and then what you think is, hey, you know, actually if you had had me there or someone like me there all along, you know, we'd be in a much better position. And we'd be, we'd be more on the proactive side than the reactive side. You know, we'd, we would have been ahead of this because we're actually doing everything that they're asking for. It's just not as front and center as it should be. And it's becoming more front and center because it's being more requested by the board. So as it's becoming more front and center, this book is all about giving you the language and giving you the tools and the, you know, and the, and the mindset really to be that person that they're like, we can't do this without you. So if you're a prospect researcher uh, and, you're, and you're out there and you want to get a better seat at the table, step up in the organization, have better communication with leadership and make some of these points. What are some key things you need to do? So, number one, and this is a chapter about um, we're in the relationship business and it's all about connectedness. Number one is to allocate more of your time actually genuinely connecting with your stakeholders. When they come to you with a research request or a data request or a report need, they're not really coming to you for that need. That need is just an excuse to connect because we're social beings, we're social creatures. And so this conference is just an excuse for all of us to get together and hang out, right? And then learn from each other and work from each other. I mean, of course, we get the benefits of you know, what we need, but really at the heart of it, what we need is that connection. And so if you foster those, those connections, and when you come over, you know, you're not all curmudgeon -y and you're not all like, get away, oh, you know, don't, you know, and you actually you know, spend that extra time. I would say every, every, a researcher would need to allocate five to 10% of their time building relationships. Mm -hmm. and, and we're in the relationship business just like the fundraisers are. Our donors or our constituents, our portfolio is our constituents. It's the annual giving folks, it's the major giving folks, principal giving folks, senior leadership. We treat it like that and that's what I've done. I mean, this book is really um, what got me from, you know, being a, uh, in gift processing to with like within five years becoming a director and then seven years of being a director to being an AVP. Okay. And so, I mean, you're sort of talking about managing up, you know, in, in a, a variation, but when, when you get invited to the board meeting yes. and the, the, the corporate titans are looking at you, I mean, what, what's missing in their eyes? I mean, what, I guess it's sort of, sort of the, um, the prospect research methods. What are they looking for that you're satisfying them about? What they're looking for and what I'm satisfying them and I'm building their confidence in is that we have the infrastructure in place that is op fully operational, that's firing on all cylinders, that's making sure we're not losing any revenue, leaving any revenue on the table, and that we're engaging our donors and providing a donor experience, that we're distilling all that data down. We have the tools and capabilities to distill all that data down so that everything that folks are working on is right donor, right place, right time, right ask and that we have the visuals, the data, the reports that is necessary that is up to the moment, up to the minute for leadership to look and, and correct course and pivot and move um, and make sure you know that if we're if we're low on solicitations in the, a certain range we then then the focus is okay we need to build up these solicitations because our revenue projections are saying that we're not going to hit goal. And so does that mean you've gotten smarter across the board at analyzing the data sort of presenting the data, distributing the data, operationalizing who's taking and using the data. Is that comprehensive? It is. So it's like if you remember the show Rachel Ray, 30 Minute Meals or whatever. You know, does this, anybody remember Rachel is, Ray? This is not where I thought he was going to go. Oh, this is where I'm going. It's one-stop <laughs> shopping. Do you remember that phrase that she used to always say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. It's one-stop <laughs> shopping. You have to do soup to nuts. It is that entire machine that you're building. And I think, you know, uh, we have to make sure that our departments are set up so that we can do that. Brian, not only are you a student of philosophy, you watch Rachel Ray too. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. 30 Nathan. minutes is about my attention span. Right? I'm telling you. Rachel Ray, was, Rachel Ray was where it was at a couple of years ago. I apologize, Nathan. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. 
<laughs> so yeah, so it's so it, it is. I mean, it's literally because we, you know, another thing is that we're silo busters because we have that vision, right? We work with everybody, so we are in the unique place to where we can see what everybody's doing, whatever, what, what's going on across the enterprise. Absolutely. Nobody else is in that position except for senior leadership, but they're not close enough to the ground in doing it day to day. So I would argue that our vision is even better than senior leadership's vision. Um, and so we need to take that vision and not be afraid, step out of our shelves. You know, I was just talking in my presentation, we're not these like, you know, uh, people who want to sit and, and just like, you know, not talk to folks. We're extroverts just as much as we are introverts. There's no such thing as an extrovert or an introvert. We're, we're, we're everything on the spectrum. One day we're more extroverted, one day we're more introverted. So don't believe that, you know, that, that pill that they're trying to make you swallow that says we're all introverts. We're not. You know, get out there and, and work and, and work with your, with your senior leadership and your colleagues and present to them the vision that you see. Say, hey, this is what I see. This is where everything's going on together. Connect where you see things that need to be connected that aren't connected, um, and then bring that high-level strategy. And that's why we are necessary, you know, at the table because we have we are this undervalued asset that if you give us a voice, um, and you literally work on what you know what's in this book, not only will you get invited to the table, but they won't they won't have meetings without you. Right? It'll be like the VPs who are always on vacation or always traveling or whatever, and you can never get on their schedule. You'll be like that person. They won't have the meeting unless you're there. Well, and I, what I like about that as well, too, is that you really talked about that concept of uh, putting everything in one place where people can see it, right? And, and so actually the Rachel Ray thing, the cooking show, the compact <laughs> cooking show is, is not too far off because yep. people have heard this from me before. In 2019, the, the most scarce resources are time and attention. Yep. And, you know, I love them to death. Senior advancement leaders sometimes uh, have a lot going on, yep. and their their attention and their ability to you know they've only got a few minutes maybe. Yep. Additionally, our board members often come to our campus, and they've they've just got very limited amounts of time. So yep. we have to come up with ways to visualize these things, explain it um, in, in pretty clear ways. Well, yeah, and the senior absolutely. people know what they know and they know what's gotten them to where they are. Yeah. And I'm sure that's been true for generations of this, right? I think today, as he points out, it's maybe more, um, they're more exposed because yeah. of how quickly best practice has evolved. Yep. Yes. That all of a sudden, we go get Nathan yeah. becomes yep. uh, something that you hear more often rather than not. Well, and they're not staying in positions that long. I mean, senior leaders in, in advancement organizations are staying in positions three years, four yeah. years. Yeah. You know, we're not, we're not seeing the 20-year VP anymore. It's not happening. Yeah. No. And prospect research, as I would probably say, in advancement services, is, has the long and it has the longest tra career trajectory. Where you got people who've been in your organization for 10, 15, 20 years, with, um, with paper files. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I have a question for you. If yeah. I'm at a small shop, does this book depress me? No. <laughs> no, it empowers you. No matter. <laughs> I would have, no, yeah, he was no, waiting for that. No book. matter where you're at. No matter where you're at. That, that literally, like, actually, it's on the back, man. This <laughs> book is a, is a tool for empowerment. Like, like, it doesn't matter what shop you're at because, I mean, really, what, what's, what's, what, I, what I love about studying philosophy and the way that I, you know, wrote this book is that, you know, the greatest philosophers never really wrote anything down because they believed as soon as you wrote it down and you made it, you know, you know, whatever, um, um, gospel, yeah, then, then it's, no, then it's stagnant, it's not living. And then people cling to the wrong things. Right? So what I try to do is write this book in a way where it's a living document, where you kind of can just, whatever chapter you resonate with, you'll resonate. And it's not telling you anything, it's more just explaining the essence of stuff and giving some practical tips. And it's almost like done through stories, but it's not really a story, right? So when you hear a story, so the great sages would teach through telling stories. And the reason why they did that is because everybody would resonate with something in that story. Sure. And everybody would come out of that talk and say, that dude was talking exactly to me, because they talked through a story versus just a lecture and so anybody can relate and it's wherever you're at in your life is going to depend that's going to that's going to determine what character you relate to what what type what part of that character you relate to but when you tell a good story there's enough in there for everybody to relate so i think that hopefully this book does that as well so if you're in a small shop you'll relate to this in the small shop mind and it'll help you to grow grow your program just as much as if you're in a big shop just as much as if, actually if you have just newly started in the field or if you've been in the field for 10 20 years um there's definitely like a lot of value in this for you well and i think that that's i think that's very astute in particular when we take a look at some of the research that's been done on how people make major and plan giving decisions it is in fact this concept of autobiographical storytelling and, and we've certainly seen that from the work of russell james at texas tech and 
what we see as when people make these major wealth distribution decisions, they are in some way t telling their, their story. And, and the best fundraisers get people to tell stories, and the best prospect researchers provide a story to a fundraiser to, to approach that prospect. That's a key part, part of the decision. Now, I've asked a couple hundred fundraisers over the last few years, what percentage of their prospects do they feel are truly qualified to make a gift? And the highest response I've ever received is about 36 percent, mm -hmm. which is not great. <laughs> That's precise. It's pretty, pretty <laughs> pretty double, double so, high. You know, generally speaking, um, fundraisers believe that their prospects are not great. Um, why do you think that is? I mean, why are we for for you know the opposite of your book? Why are we perhaps not that precise? Why are we providing lists of prospects or processes that identify people who maybe are not so great to approach? You know, um, I'm going to turn that question around a little, right? Um, and and tell a story that actually I actually tell this story in the book because this is definitely the perennial problem that I think that we face as well. Um, and I do think that you know, you, when a fundraiser is having a good year, they got a great portfolio. When they're not having a good year, they got a bad portfolio, right? Whenever anything's going wrong, it's like I don't have enough prospects, you know. So, so you know, so you, you, so I'm aware of the nature of the job and the nature of you know, kind of a sales job is you know, if you're not hitting your quota, it's always because you don't have the right leads, right? And so, you know, that's not always true. So I had actually built you know early in my career as the director at Stanford Children's Hospital um, research. Uh, we had we had built the pipeline enough to where we were able to expand the major gifts team and hire another fundraiser, and I was so excited by this portfolio because I just thought it was the best portfolio like I'd ever built. And um, I built this portfolio. New guy comes on, you know. I'm so excited. I can't wait. Actually, I, it was a little ego. I couldn't wait for him to like just love me because I was giving him the best portfolio ever. Right? So I was like, this guy's gonna love me. He owes me, right? He's gonna have to take me out to lunch like monthly because I'm because I'm hooking him up and he's gonna have like the most success ever. Well, before I got to meet with him, guess what he did? He socialized that portfolio with every other major gift officer there in a one-on-one -on -one meeting where they both went through the portfolio and they told him whatever they knew about prospects in that portfolio. Guess what they said? There's not one viable prospect in that portfolio. And not only that, but they went name after name and said, this person's never going to give, this person's never going to give, this person's never going to give. He goes to the next person, they, they have a whole list of people who aren't going to give that, you know, were new to, the, new to the list. So by the end of it, he essentially was like, this is a horrible portfolio, right? So I go into that meeting not knowing that that happened. I'm all excited. I'm waiting for him to congratulate me and, you know, give high fives and be like, woo, woo, let's celebrate. You're going you're to be a rainmaker. Instead, he looks at me and he's all depressed. And I was like, hey, what's going on? Are you okay? What's wrong? And he said, I met with everybody and they basically told me this portfolio you just gave me is, is crap. And like, I'm not going to be able to raise any money and I'm freaking out because I just changed jobs and like now I'm here and like, what am I going to do? Like, this is, this is like, man, help me out. I need, I need a new portfolio. I need better prospects. I was like, whoa, what do I do? on my toes. I just thought of something real quick and I just threw it out there and I just said, hey, I said, you know, the data is telling me, because I use analytics and stuff to build this portfolio. I said, the data is telling me something completely different than what they're telling you. The data is screaming that, these, that this, pro this portfolio is chock full of amazing prospects that are just waiting to give. This thing is pure potential. And I said, trust me, keep your beginner's mind. They're jaded. Don't be jaded like them. You're new here. Ignore that. Trust me, a portfolio is pure potential. That's all it is. It only exists in a state of pure potential. It is up to you, the fundraiser, to unlock that potential. The better the fundraiser, the more potential you'll be able to unlock. So I flipped it around, right, and threw it, threw it that way. And, he was, and it worked. He was like, yeah, you're right. Like, you're right. And we went through and I was like, look, recent donor, recent donor. I said, trust me, this is a good portfolio. Work this portfolio. And if, if, you don't, if nothing happens, come back to me, you know, in a few months and we'll figure something out. Three months go by. $3.8 million gift. A few more months, another million dollar gift. Another month, another million dollar gift. He raised more money with that portfolio, which was filled with duds, than anybody else in the entire shop. And it was his first year. And you know how hard that is for a major gift officer to come in and in three months get a almost sure. $4 million dollar gift? So guess what happened? A line came to my door of all the other fundraisers saying, we want a portfolio like his. You gave him all the good prospects. <laughs> <laughs> <Can't win. laughs>
So, so my answer to that is, you know, percentage, that's like historically speaking, you could get a percentage and look back and say what, what happened. But at the end of the day, in my opinion, if we do our job well, we're giving them the, a portfolio with the highest degree of potential with hopefully the easiest, you know what I mean, path to success. I know the book is still new, but anything on the horizon we need to know about, about the next new thing? Oh, oh I got a lot going on. <laughs> I, I got a couple other books actually I'm working on, and I want to actually expand this book into a, 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 like a more just general data book for any data professional, because some of my friends who are in the for-profit sector read it, and they're just like, dude, this, this equally is valuable for us. And like, so I'm thinking about doing a generic, a generic one um, that's just about data and really goes a little bit more into my philosophy of what data is um, and how you know kind of everything is data and um, we're all analysts and you know um, uh, so I got that I got a screenplay I'm writing on AI I'm doing <laughs> some work in AI. on it yes yes <laughs> oh, I'm really excited about that one actually yes excellent so sci-fi well for the moment congratulations on the first book thank you and it's a pleasure having you here at meeting of the minds and uh, and thanks for uh, being part of the, the yeah fun. thanks for inviting me this was great thanks